Welcome to episode four of Born to Roam. Uh, what's up all you crazy cats and kittens out there? Um, so obviously today I am here to, uh, to interview the one, the only, RM Wizard Castle, uh, Ross the Boss Hoss, Awesome Sauce Miller. And let it be known that it wasn't easy to schedule an interview with you. I got a lot of things to do. Uh, I'm a busy guy, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Uh, in your room. As long as we keep it brief. Yeah, keep it brief. Uh, you know what not to talk about. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, happy to be here up in your room. It's very rare that I'm allowed up here. And uh, <laughs> I'm just looking at all the ambiance. It's so bright. It's a, there's a bright future up here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, your, your, your publicist and your management was very clear about what not to talk about. I'm, I was also instructed that, that I'm not allowed to stand up at any point during the interview. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> we've established the ground rules. We've read through the paperwork. It's trying to get into it. So, Ross, for qu first question, how are you? I'm quite splendid. How are you? I'm very well. I just want to know, how, how is your apocalypse going? How are you, uh, how are you faring with the, the current circumstances? It's definitely sad that people are sick and whatnot. Um, everything's kind of the same for me. I just been like playing bass in my room. I got an Xbox. I haven't really been playing games on the Xbox, but I've been streaming mad Blink-182 videos. Uh, I realized that they are the music of the future and the past. And uh, same with Bowling for Soup. Uh, I'd like to give them some uh, shout outs right now. Uh, Rancid too. Rancid's sick. I used to only like Maxwell Murder because like, obviously the bass was sick, but like there's more songs. Who would have thought? But yeah, sick band. Is that, did I just ruin the whole interview? No, no, no. I, I got lots more. <laughs> I got lots more related questions. So we'll get into the current listening. But I'd like to just give everybody out there a little bit of a, a backstory, a bit of like an origin story of uh, one Ross, the boss Hoss Miller. Uh, so can you talk about what was like growing up in Niagara? We were just watching some RCHC videos on the old TV. But what, describe what it was like. Uh, uh, on the top of your mind, what it was like kind of growing up in the music scene in Niagara and what was what was what were the bands that were currently playing and what was it like? Uh, it was awesome. I grew up in Font Hill, which is kind of like a, like a suburb. Um, and there wasn't like I had friends that showed me music that who had older brothers who uh, went to school in Welland. Mm -hmm. uh, which is where I ended up going to high school, but I would learn about um, I don't know, like the Misfits and AFI. Of course, Blink-182, The Goats, and uh, I was into like Sum 41 and stuff, and that was really cool. Then when I went to high school, I met uh, a lot of my good friends um, that I still keep in touch with today, and they introduced me to hardcore, and hardcore was like a, a predominant genre in Welland. There was a band called uh, Dana Deathwish that I was just listening to, and I really liked them. Keep It Up was like my first favorite hardcore band that are kind of more uh, what I'm into now. There was a band called The Ceremonial Snips, and which turned to The Snips, and members of that band own Press Time and are affiliated with D-Boy. Yeah, just like really, really talented musicians who really honed in their craft uh, really, really well. I was just listening to them and I was just like, Oh my God, I can't even play those songs now. Like they're, they were really good. And, uh, yeah, I was very fortunate to be part of, or like kind of like see the end of uh, a very exciting musical music scene that kind of slightly dwindled over time. Mm. As it does, as it does. As it does. Rise and fall. But yeah. uh, you, you were fortunate enough, though, you feel to be, you know, a part of uh, what was clearly a very flourishing music scene uh, with, you know, some great venues and a lot of great bands, it seemed like. For sure. Yeah, it was uh, a mixture between um, kind of like in a weird way, in a good way, in a bad way. But the caliber of musician musicians in my area were so good that you couldn't really get away with being bad mm. like you kind of had to like really bring your a game or else like everybody like there was the the bedlam message board owned by uh papa joel and which turned to the c music message board and if you posted something that uh wasn't uh good you'd get uh you get attacked and oh boy i was I attacked see. many a times yeah oh. 
So talk a little bit about this message board because obviously uh, that message board eventually was kind of a precursor to Joel starting, uh, was it a precursor to him starting Bedlam or uh, was it uh, was Bedlam kind of an associated thing while he was doing the message board? Well, I hope he listens because he can correct me. It's a little, I was young when it was, yeah. but Bedlam I think started off as a, uh, um, like a music review, a message board and whatnot. And he, there was also shows affiliated yeah. with it. And then also like Joel had a big part of the scene music festival. So the, that board eventually switched to the scene music board because I think the scene music festival for a long time was uh, pretty big. It was awesome. It was really well attended. Uh, some of my favorite moments ever have happened musically have happened at that festival, which was equally important. But yeah, Joel um, Carrier, who owns Dynalone Records, who started Dynalone Records, uh, was like a, a huge, like huge importance to the Niagara music scene. Also with Alexa on Fire, who, who were also very important to uh, things happening in Niagara, mm -hmm. kind of starting the magic. And there was a lot of great bands around the same time, but I think Alexa on Fire obviously was the biggest band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they certainly uh, became... Yeah. Uh, very, very large. Uh, I guess when it comes to the, 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 the message boards and stuff, was that in and around or like slightly before kind of a Facebook time and that was a place where people could uh, basically talk about local music and what was happening? Absolutely. I think MySpace, for me at least, uh, was around the same time. Yeah. I think, I don't remember exactly. For me, I think it was roughly around the same time that was happening, but I remember... Uh, before I would listen to music on MySpace, uh, I have a distinct memory of hearing um, the first Attack and Black demo. I'm pretty sure, like right, right after uh, Dan's band Dead Only Better broke up on Pure Volume, and that, that was before MySpace. Mm -hmm. So I remember that uh, very, very well. And then I think people would go to the Bedlam message board or the C message board. And there would be a link to that, kind of similar to what you see on Instagram now or okay. on Facebook. There's a link to somewhere else, and then you go there. And uh, yeah, either it would be highly praised or <laughs> there'd be some. Uh, would, there, some... It'd be like, I like what you did better. I'm like, the drums are off time. And like, yeah. not in any band in particular, but uh, like, do you even know how to play the D beat yet? Kind of yeah. stuff like that. Like <laughs> a lot of chirping. Your vocals are trash. Like yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Some 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 pr some glowing reviews, some chirping, and some crucifixions happen on the on the message boards. Oh yeah, it was the wild wild west. Wild wild west. Um, and so you know, as we were just watching that video downstairs of uh, some RCHC, uh, it looks like you guys had some real lit shows in the uh, in the the Rose City and the Rose City surrounding area. Was that kind of your memory of things that most sh that there was a lot of really popping off local shows yeah um definitely uh like i said earlier it kind of unfortunately dwindled over time but uh and i caught the tail end like i i think i started high school in 2004 mm -hmm. and i think the most popular time of that was 2004 2001 to 2004 i could be wrong but around that time that's when like on any given friday like 500 kids would come to a show in yeah. wayland and like they would like fill these like like club social and the lions hall and all that stuff and like it's funny because i think about it and like those bands who are they seem like a million years older than me at the time <laughs> they still do now but uh uh they seem so much older but they weren't that much older and like they could easily have made a career just playing in well and to like because they were selling like like warp tour type of like Volume amounts of merch, merch yeah. and like like i remember like when i was a kid i would like wear a hoodie the hoodie of a band and then wear the same band's t-shirt under the hoodie nice. like i was just like obsessed murder thy maker maybe that's why i'm like super into like rancid and stuff now because i was so obsessed with niagara bands and i kind of felt that was my thing that yeah. any other band for a long time in my like teenage years didn't seem as cool or as important because like it was cool to have the pride of the music the mu music around you kind of thing. And you could see them and get in the pit and like the shows were exciting. And then, like I said, like by the time I started playing music, nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems even like from all of the videos and stuff that I've kind of seen that you've pulled up on the, on the old television is that basically that there was a, 
those shows all look lit. You haven't pulled up one video where it looked like anything, and it didn't. Nothing looked like a local show, like in terms of what today's version of a local show yeah. looks like. You know, they all look like the a touring band from England has come in, and it's crazy that they're here, and it's amazing that we get to see them. And that's the energy level that people are in, like disbelief that they get to be there. It's insane. It's like I, I think like maybe some of the people who were part of that age group or have done music things after. I don't, I, I think they might belittle how beautiful it was that that many people love singing along love and how, even though the songs were, I think they were unique to our area, but there's definitely some like, uh, you can definitely see where they, um, borrowed from other bands and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, even though that, that might not necessarily be a popular style of music to people of, my age group or their grade age group now, I think they're really, really good. I think like because of the their passion to their craft, uh, it got a lot of people excited and created a really cool thing for a while. Would I be kind of over assuming to you know to think that witnessing such awesome shows from a young age had a lot to do with like how you initially became obsessed with music was it was that a big part of it seeing people and being a part of such a you know an energetic reaction to a band was a, a really powerful thing that is uh, still impacting you today a hundred percent I think like definitely the the feeling of excitement that I would get to see like early attack and black keep it up the snips unfortunately I only caught the reunion for Death Wish and Murder That Maker, like actually I did see Murder That Maker. I'm sure if like some people from Welland heard this, it'd be like, yeah, yeah they think it's a poser or whatever, but <laughs> I'm not. So yeah, like the excitement of seeing these bands and like honestly, like being like, these guys are the coolest, this is the best. Like I would be so pumped that when I started music, I was just so pumped to do it mm -hmm. that I think like from like very early on, I just had like, incredible excitement towards it i think like sometimes my i especially at my like early years my ex excitement outweighed my uh musicianship but uh maybe that's the case now too i think that i think that's the way it's all it always should be yeah when, for sure <laughs> yeah. when things are best is uh it's when excitement comes first over uh, your actual ability to do shit I was just going to ask, we, you know, you and I have had this discussion before, but your first kind of song slash album artist that really made you excited about music rather than, uh, you know, walking around in daily life as a kid hearing like background noise and be like, oh, that's a song. But, you know, you've mentioned to me that it was Shaggy. Shaggy for sure. Shaggy Hotshot was um, a huge record for me. I still love it to this day. It gets Great me record. so hyped. Great uh, record. Uh, my first favorite song of all time was Living in a Vida Loca by Ricky Martin. Yes. And I remember my mom, she went to Costco and she bought, uh, I remember this, it was a CD player, like Walkman CD player. It was gold. I think it was Sony. So like she was making some money. That yeah, was yeah. sick, right? And then like she had that and she bought the Ricky Martin CD and I was living in Ottawa at the time or I was visiting Ottawa or something. Mm -hmm. And I remember just pacing up and down the stairs, listening to like, I didn't care about any other song on that record. Like I was just living to be, and I still kind of listen to music this way, but like, so I just like want to like know every single thing about the song. Dice, dissect it. And yeah. And then that and, uh, Willennium. Nice. Yeah. What's with, the, is that, uh, like Miami getting jiggy with Ma it. Getting jiggy with it. Yeah. Yeah. That was like Formative. gigantic. I think that was my first, like, like CD that my parents bought for me. Nice. That or Hot Shot, probably around the same time. Some two two heavy hitters, two yeah. or three heavy hitters in a row right there. When did you kind of become interested in the idea of making hip hop? Because you had obviously played uh, in some awesome bands early on, uh, Consumer Alert, uh, Cat on Acid. Yeah. You uh, dipped your toes in doom metal with uh, Sound Asleep. Uh, yeah. When, at what point were you like, hey, I want to do some hip hop now? And what were what what kind of made you kind of go in that direction? Well, I think it came clearly based on like my first few favorite CDs. Like mm -hmm. I've always loved like I don't think it's crummy, but like kind of like commercial R and B hip hop kind of thing. So that was always like I was always just so pumped on that. Like whenever I hear anything of that, like Usher, anything like like Top I, 40 I just love that stuff so much that 
I wouldn't necessarily throw it on all the time, but if it was on the radio or if someone put on, put a, the CD on, I would, I'd be in the pit for sure. But like, I remember I was helping record a single mother's record called Our Pleasure. And great record. Thanks. It's pretty sick. My favorite. And uh, we were recording and me and Jess has played in a hardcore band, kind of hardcore band. I've been told is called an art project, but uh, referred to as an art project, but a band called Sideman Woo. that uh, Justice and I wrote songs for. And uh, our good friend, Riley Simpson, who also plays or played in Single Mothers, played drums on. And we had that band and that was really cool. And then we, me and Justice decided to help with a Single Mothers record. And we were in the studio and we heard uh, through Darren, uh, who was uh, engineering the record at Jacasa, who's awesome, who's actually Steele's cousin, Steele oh, from yeah. Lost on Fire's cousin. He told us that there's a battle of the bands happening somewhere. I don't remember, but uh, oh, Simcoe. Simco. I'll never forget. Shout Simco. out to Simcoe. Shout out to Simcoe. Battle of the bands in Simcoe. And if you win, you can uh, get studio time at Jacasa. And me and Justice were like, Yo, we gotta do this. Yeah. We come back to Jacasa and lay like a six Simon song down. And just for some backstory, uh, can you just kind of explain a little bit why, like, Jucasa is like a one, a beautiful studio? Yeah. Why it, you'd want to record there again? It's gigantic. Yeah. Uh, it's owned by a, a guy who has a ton of money who built it for his son who owns like tobacco money in Caledonia. Darren is super, super easy to work with. Really cool. It's just like, it honestly feels like I am Usher and I'm recording. Yeah. For, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, uh, Did you say that justice is your little John. No, I, I'd be little John to his Usher. You know, <laughs> you know how, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? But, uh, yeah. So like we wanted to record, <laughs> but like, we also like haven't rehearsed in a long time. And like we had our friends, Garrett, Bo and, uh, Riley and Nick Giamarco in the band. And uh, we haven't rehearsed them for, with them for a while. So we we're just like, okay, how do we do this without having to rehearse? Because like rehearsal kind of sucks. So we we're just like, okay, how about we make backing tracks? And then we just rap all the songs. Because me and Justice Live would both sing. Uh, like I'd be more of the screamer and he'd be more of the melodic guy. And then sometimes he'd scream. Sometimes I'd sing too, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit of a... But anyway, yeah, so we did the show and... Uh, we rapped and we made beats and like me and Justice are like gigantic Beastie Boys fans too. So we just ripped that off and there we go. We did that. And then from that day on, we just fired the band and yeah. just <laughs> played with an iPod. Way cheaper. Way cheaper. <laughs> you just got to plug it in. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Circling back to hardcore for a second here. Was there, you, you mentioned earlier on that there was, you kind of had friends with older brothers that maybe showed you those kinds of first things. Uh, introduced you. Do you remember the kind of moment at all, or at least the kind of time? Uh, what, what are your first recollections of hardcore and how it touched you? My friend Scott David, uh, which I guess this isn't. No, no, I guess it would be. And like it is hardcore. Actually, I'm wearing it sure now. Uh, my friend Scott David, who lived in Font Hill with, he was like my best friend growing up. He was like a super good skateboarder. Uh, was really good at guitar, just all around beast at everything. And uh, he, his older brother was super into blank. That was sick. Show me blank. Yeah. And then uh, was also super into Rage Against the Machine. And I remember him showing me Rage and being like, like Evil Empire. And I was like, this is like the craziest thing. I remember hearing it being like, this kind of like sounds like the, like the rap parts in Sum 41. <laughs> and I was like, well then like they must be influenced by some 41 <laughs> <laughs> and then like, there you go. So I remember that. I remember being in his room and him having his brother's uh, Epiphone SG custom with the three gold pickups and us like, just be like, this is the craziest thing. And then his brother got really mad that we took it into like his, like Scott's room. And he probably like did something bad or whatever. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I remember him being kind of angry. Uh, but <laughs> there was always the older brother dynamic where you, the younger brother would come in and like yeah. check what he's got. And the older brother would always get angry. Yeah, I remember like, and they were both like super, like I was like, I was a chonky little lad. I loved everything tasty. And uh, I remember they had all the good treats and uh, they were into like all they got into all the bad shit first. You know what I'm saying? So like, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it was, a, uh, it was definitely the cool guy's house yeah. and like, I was just along for the ride. <laughs> it was paradise. Yeah. 
And so he, this this older brother, cheers, he showed Scott. you. Yeah, cheers. So he showed you Rage Against the Machine, and and then from there, did you kind of uh, did you have somebody else kind of introduce you to? Were you were you introduced to first wave hardcore first, or, or was it more local stuff, and then you worked backwards? I owe a lot of it to Justice, like Justice, like uh, who I met first period of Gray Nine. Yeah, first period, first like everything, Mr. Gallagher's geography class. Nice. I remember he had big, like a huge afro. I thought he looked like, and I'm from Font Hill, like a suburb, and I'm like, that dude's a freak. But for some reason, he was drawn to me, probably because I was so chonky, and like he was just like, I haven't seen a chonky boy like that ever. <laughs> We were just drawn to together, together. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, without like, he showed me a lot of like the Welland groups, and uh, I remember they were like repping like like OG. Like I remember like Justice and like Ben Pokel. Uh, they would be wearing like just like super like tight pants and like really like like old like looking like like rip off hardcore shirts that like attack and attack and black and keep it up and a day of death wish made. Yeah. And they would just be showing me all these bands and stuff. And they were like, Oh, let's bring Ross to the show. And I remember the first show I went to it was at St. Catharines at red square. And, uh, they, they got into the pit for attack and black and, uh, they made me hold all their coats while they're in the pit. <laughs> so I was a disc kind of, I could have been in that pit, you know, could have been working off some of those calories. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They were trying to keep me chonky. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but <laughs> there was also a local skateboard shop called Cyril that Mike Todd owned in Fawn Hill. And he would carry uh, like all the band's hardcore shirts and stuff. And Keep It Up used to say fuck a lot in all their songs. And they had a shirt. I forget the actual quote, but it was like, how many how many times can they say fuck in a song or something? It was like a review on the shirt. Yeah, and I was yeah, like, yeah. fuck, this band's so sick. Yeah. But it was too small. So it was so fat. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, I would say that, you know, critics and uh, audiences have called you the, the prince of hardcore. And how do you <laughs> how do you respond to such a to such an honor? Do you do you accept it? Do you feel it's an understatement? How do you feel about that? I definitely don't feel like I've I've been uh, over the years been uh, distracted by the lack of amount of hardcore I've played for multiple reasons. I, I love other types of music, but I really love hardcore and I've always cherished peers of mine who play hardcore like wild side. And uh, my friend Cody plays in a band called mill spec that I think are really good. And I've always just like really, 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 really liked hardcore. Uh, I just like been busy doing other things. Right. But uh, yeah, I think it's like, the most important genre to me uh, for because it's just excitement and it's like very skilled playing. Yeah, just constantly thinking about writing hardcore songs. Shout out to Blue. Shout out to Blue. I, I definitely like playing hardcore and listening to hardcore. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to, again, thank you for including me in the, uh, in the Blue shows earlier this year. And if you missed those, fuck you. Yeah, last show, Toronto. Maybe, I don't know. I was going to record, but coronavirus happened so but now i'm into pop punk so i don't know we'll see where we are in see, a few months. see where we are yeah in a couple weeks or so you know um okay so we've got uh we're, we're, we're kind of i guess drawing to the end of my prepared questions um but uh, i'd like to do a little bit of a lightning round uh for you sure so today as of today what is it the, the 19th or something 17th. 17th does it even matter anymore <laughs> what day it is um okay uh <laughs> Uh, all right. Blink or the Chili's? Blink. Flea or Jesus? Flea. Jelly beans or Twizzlers? Oh, dude. That was one of the questions I told you not to ask me, bro. Oh, shit. Dude, I'm out. I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> just drop yeah, the mic, yeah. yeah, I'm fucking out of you. Twizzlers. Yeah. Ooh. And uh, one of our prepared questions uh, from an outside source was, uh, in 30 seconds... Do you think you could name every band that you've, uh, or artist that you've worked with? I can try my best. Okay, <laughs> let's hear it. Consumer Alert, Sound Asleep, Cat on Acid, Northern Primitive, Bitter Hearts, Marine Dreams, Daniel Romano, Spencer Burton, Young Wife, Single Mothers, Side Man, The Dirty Nil, yeah, yeah, um, Shotgun Jimmy, Stephen Lamkey, Oh, zero. 
You got 15. Yeah. 15's pretty darn good if I do say so myself. I'm probably missing some. I thought of Canyon Carvers also. Canyon Carvers, yeah. Zero, which is my hardcore band with uh, my friends back home. Mm -hmm. you, got a, you got a pretty good amount of them, though. Well, For yeah. sure, yeah. Well done. As we're closing up here... Mr. Miller, uh, what kind of uh, message do you have for the world or uh, anybody out there listening, all five of you? Um, what, uh, what would you like to, uh, to broadcast to the good people who are stuck in their homes right now and um, who, are, uh, who are looking uh, to you for some, uh, for some thoughts on the current situation? Well, you know, like, no one could be prob no one's prepared for anything like this, right? But... Uh, I think it's important to uh, obviously keep a positive attitude, um, really embrace uh, the people you're surrounded with, uh, and really try to just make light of any scenario. Like, uh, I think it's super easy to be uh, caught up reading the news and everything, and I think it's important to know what's happening, but I also think it's important to enjoy life. So. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of happy music and I've been listening, watching a lot of happy movies and uh, that's keeping my energy going. Yeah, I hope everybody is, uh, I've been enjoying playing bass on some people's songs that they've been sending me. And uh, I think uh, what we can learn is uh, we're all just a big community. It doesn't matter what bands you play in. It doesn't matter how chonky you were, how chonky I am or whatever. Like it doesn't matter. It's just, it's all about uh, just like embracing everybody's uh, good qualities and even their bad qualities sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like I'm about to drop like the sickest, uh, jam ever. And, uh, I don't know if it's going to line up with this, you know what I'm saying? But, um, yo, stream that stuff. Yo, Papa's got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much from born to Rome. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. And thanks for having me in your band, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> much love, uh, job bless. And, uh, blink away to forever. All the small things.